the calm. I was getting a haircut. I was in a chair and three men were sitting along the wall across from me. Two of the men were waiting I'd never seen before, but one of them I recognised, though I couldn't exactly place him. I kept looking at him as the barber walked down my hair. The man was moving a toothpick around in his mouth, a heavy set man, short wavy hair. And then I saw him in a cap and a uniform, little eyes watchful in the lobby of a bank. Of the other two, one was considerably the older, with a full head and of curly grey hair. He was smoking. The third, though not so old, was nearly bald on top, but the hair at the sides hung over his ears. He had unlocking boots, pants shiny with machine oil. The barber put a hand on top of my hair to turn me for a better look. Then he said to the guards, Did you get your deer, Charles? I like this barber. We weren't acquainted well enough to call each other by name. But when I came in for a haircut, he knew me. He knew I used to fish, so we'd talk fishing. I don't think he hunted, but he could talk on any subject. In this regard, he was a good barber. Bill, it's a funny story. The damn, the damnedest thing, the guard said. He took out the toothpick and laid it in the ashtray. He shook his head. I did and I didn't, so yes and no to your question. I didn't like the man's voice. For a guard, the voice didn't fit. It wasn't the voice you'd expect. The two other men looked up. The old man was turning the pages of a magazine smoking and the other fellow was holding a newspaper. They put down what they were looking at and turned to listen to the guard. Go on, Charles, the barber said. Let's hear it. The barber turned my head again and went back to work with his clippers. We were up on the fickle ridge, my old man and me and the kids. We were hunting the straws. My old man was stationed at the head of one and me and the kid were at the head of another. The kid had Hanover. God damn, he's hide. The kid who was grinning around the gills and drank water all day, mine and his both. It was in the afternoon and we'd been out since daybreak. But we had our hopes. The figure of the hunter down below would move a deer in our direction, so we were sitting behind a log and watching a draw when we heard this shooting down in the valley. There's orchards down there, said the fellow with the newspaper. He was fidgeting a lot and kept crossing a leg, swinging his boot for a time and then crossing his legs the other way. Those deer hang out around those orchards. That's right, said the god. They go in there at night, the bastard, and eat those little green apples. Well, we heard the shooting and we were just sitting there on our hands when this big old buck comes up out of the underbrush not a hundred feet away. The kid sees him the same time I do, of course, and he throws down and starts banging the knot head. The old buck wasn't in any danger, not from the kid, as it turns out, but he can't tell where the shots are coming from. He doesn't know which way to jump, then I get off a shot, but in all the commotion, I just stunned him. Stunned him? The barber said. You know, stun him, got it. It was a gunshot. It just like stuns him, so he drops his head and begins this trembling. He trembles all over. The kid's still shooting. Me, I felt like I was back in Korea, so I shot again, but missed. Then the old Mr. Buck moves back into the brush. But now, by God, he doesn't have an arm for left in him. The kid has emptied his goddamn gun, all to no purpose, but I hit solid. I rammed one night in his guts. That's what I meant by stunned him. Then what? said the fellow with the newspaper, who had wrote it and was tapping it against his knee. Then what? You must have trailed, them, trailed him. They find a hard place to die every time. But you trailed him? The old man asked, though it wasn't really a question. I did. Me and the kid, we trailed him. But the kid wasn't good for much. He gets sick on the trail, slows us down. That chocolate chuckle head. The guard had to laugh now, thinking about the situation, drinking beer and chasing all night, and then this 
Men say he can hunt deer. He knows better now, by God. But shall we trail him? A good trail too. Blood on the ground and blood on the leaves. Blood everywhere. Never seen a buck with so much blood. I don't know how the sucker kept going. Sometimes they go forever. The fellow with the newspaper said. They find them a hard place to die every time. I threw the kid out for missing a shot, and when he smarted off at me, I carved him a good one. Right here, the guard pointed to the side of his head and grinned. I boxed his goddamn ears for him. The goddamn kid. He's not too old. He needed it. So the point is, it got too dark to trail. What that? What with the kid laying back to vomit and all? Well, the coyotes will have the deer by now, the fellow with the newspaper said. Them and the crows and the buzzards. He unrolled the newspaper, smoothed it all the way out, and put it off to one side. He crossed the leg again. He looked around at the rest of us and shook his head. The older man had turned in his chair and was looking out the window. He lit a cigarette. I figure so, I got it. Pity, too. He was a big old son of a bitch. So, in answer to your question, Bill, I got. I I both I both got my D and I didn't, but we had ven venison venison on the table anyway, because it turns out the old man has got himself a little spike in the meantime. Already had has him back to camp, honey up and got his slick ads, a whistle, liver, heart, a kidneys wrapped in wax paper already setting in the cooler, a spike, just a little bastard. But the old man he was tickled. The guard looked around the shop, as if remembering. Then he picked up his toothpick and stuck it back in his mouth. The older man put his cigarette out and turned to the guard. He drew a breath and said, You ought to be out there right now looking for the deer instead of in here getting a haircut. You can't talk like that, the guard said. You old fart, I've seen you someplace. I've seen you too, the old fellow said. Boys, that's enough. This is my barber shop, the barber said. I ought to box your ears, the old fellow said. You ought to try it, the guy said. Charles, the barber said. The barber put his comb and scissors on the counter and his hand on my shoulders as if he thought I was thinking to spring from the chair into the middle of it. Albert, I've seen cutting Charles' head of hair and he's a boy's too for years now. I wish you wouldn't pursue this. The barber looked from one man to the other and kept his hand on my shoulders. Take it outside, the fellow with the newspaper said, flushed and hoping for something. That would be enough, the barber said. Charles, I don't want to hear anything more on the subject. Albert, you're next in line, now. The barber turned to the fellow with the newspaper. I don't know you from an Adam, mister, but I appreciate if you wouldn't put your oar um, in. The guard got up, he said, I think I'll come back for my cut later. Right now the company leaves something to be desired. The guard went out and put the door closed, hard. The old fellow sat smoking his cigarette. He looked out the window, he examined something on the back of his hand, he got up and put on his hat. I'm sorry, Bill, the old fellow said. I can go a few more days. That's all right, Albert, the bubba said. When the old fellow went out, the barber stepped over to the window to watch him go. Albert's about dead from emphysema, the barber said from the window. We used to fish together. He taught me sa salmon inside out. The woman, the women, they used to cry all over the old boy. He's picked up a temper though, but in all honesty, there was a provocation. The man with the newspaper couldn't sit still. He was on his feet and moving around, stopping to examine everything. The hair had wreck, the full of spill, and his friend. The calendar from the hardware showing scenes from each month of the year. He flipped every page. He even went so far as to stand and scrutinize Bill's barbering license, which was up on the wall in the frame. Then he turned and said, I'm going to, and out. He went just like he said. Well, do you want me to finish barbering this hair or not? The barber said to me, as if I was the cause of everything. The barber turned to me, turned me in the chair to face the mirror. He put a hand to either side of my head. He positioned me a last time, and then he brought his head down next to mine. We looked into the mirror together, his hand still framing my head. I was looking at myself, and he was looking at me too. But if the barber saw something, he didn't offer a comment. 
He ran his fingers through my hair. He did it slowly, as if thinking about something else. He ran his fingers through my hair. He did it tenderly, as a lover would. That was in Crescent City, California, up near the Oregon border. I left soon after. But today I was thinking of that place, of Crescent City, and of how I was trying out a new life there with my wife, and how, in the barber's chair that morning, I had made up my mind to go. I was thinking today about the calm I felt when I closed my eyes and let the barber's finger move through my hair. The sweetness of those fingers. The hair already starting to grow.